It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. sheet 
just see me before you leave, please. You need to make sure that we get um, shirt sizes and just some other information from you real quick uh, to make sure that we have everything all set for you to, to go. So um, the deposit is due, the money is due for the trip. If you're not on the list yet, there's a couple spots still available. So uh, if you're not on there again, you can still see me afterwards and I'll make sure to give you the information you may need. But please see me before you go. That way we can make sure that you're all set to go. Uh, of course, that's in Bishop, about a four-hour drive up north, and uh, we're just going to have a neat time of fishing, a lot of fellowship, and you know, some good fun. Uh, there's also a holiday boutique going on the, in October 14th from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. You can see Patty Weeks for more information. She's going to have tables set up and a whole boutique going on here at the church for holiday stuff, and all of the money raised will go to uh, the children's trailer as well just to try to get that all set up. A couple things for the ladies that's uh, going on this month and next. We do have the Women's Summer Series Bible Study. You can pick up one of these flyers if you like uh, in, the, in the back foyer area. Uh, that is starting Tuesday, August 8th, which I believe is this Tuesday. Yes, it is. At 6.30 p.m. here at the church. Uh, you can sign up on the sign-up sheet. Grab one of those flyers and meet the ladies here at the church on this Tuesday, 6.30. Also, there is... A uh, little bit of a get together, a get together going on in uh, September, the eighth and 9th. So it's a weekend, a Friday and Saturday, eight thirty a.m. to ten p.m. Uh, you can grab one of these flyers, and you can go ahead and get some more information on that. There is some money due for that one, so you can get all the info on there and uh, see uh, either Pat or Virginia with more information on that. So, all right, we can have the ushers come forward this morning's tithes. Let's pray. Father, we just lift up the tithes and offerings to you this morning, Lord, and we thank you, God, that, um, that Father, you just provide for us, Lord, that you give us the ability to give back. And, and uh, Lord, we thank you that it is uh, just a simple percentage, Father, that you require. It's not a dollar amount, Lord. It's nothing that we have to work up to. But, God, you just want us to give from our heart joyfully, Father. So we just ask that you would um, just bless uh, all the funds that come in for this building, this place, Lord, that it takes to run and to keep the AC on. We pray that you just continue to bless those that just give here at this church, Father. Just be with them, Lord. Provide for the families, Father. Continue to be with these ministries, Lord, and just guide and lead uh, all the things coming up this next month. And we lift this up in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Did he mention the chocolate bag? No. Nope. So, so, so you all know uh, Senior Willie's Tacos, right, that we had a couple of weeks ago, a couple of Fridays ago? So he's going to be out here this coming Friday again at 6.30 p.m. So if you're in the area and want dinner, want a quick snack, come on by. And 20% he's donating to the church for the trailer. So he's going to be set up the same uh, place that he was set up before. So I'll open up the gates and people can park in and so forth. So he's just going to be there for the community, reaching out and um, selling tacos. And I just thought, they were so good, I'm going to come by and have a couple of tacos. <laughs> so I thought I'd invite you to join me for dinner this Friday. This Friday at 6.30 p.m. So, all right. Thank you for standing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we truly do need... Um, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to, yes. to bring truth and understanding to your scriptures, Father. So we stand here, Lord, asking that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would give us understanding. Yes, God. Father, as we stand, and as I looked out in the audience here this morning, I don't know who's outside in the courtyard, Lord, but I know that those that are in here and those that are outside, Father, have at one point in their relationship with you shouted out, and said, I do. I do to salvation. I do to Jesus Christ. I do by surrendering myself to him completely. And so this morning, we just reaffirm that 
as we are the bride, you are the groom, and you ask us to wed you, and we say, Lord, I do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's open up our Bibles. You can sit down. To Matthew chapter 22. And as you can guess, this morning's theme is, I do. <laughs> I do. I do, because we're going to be looking at a parable here of a wedding feast. They call it the parable of the marriage feast. In Luke, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 22, it's also found in Luke, verses 1 through 14. <clears throat> 1 through 14. So this morning's theme is, I do. Aren't marriages exciting? Yes. We just went to one yesterday. Randy's not here because he got married. Yes, and he's flying do. over to um, New York right now to see Niagara Falls with his new bride. And I'll tell you what, I have done a lot of uh, marriage ceremonies. I'm looking around to see. I've, I've done a few here. And i tell you, that ceremony was just so intimate and it was just so special. It's probably one of the best marriage ceremonies that I've ever been to. It was in someone's living room. Everybody were just dressed casually in shorts, some people, and um, I think there was one person with a tie. And that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> and that was fun. But it was just such a neat little ceremony. I was really blessed by it. And to see those that came out just to say to Randy, and, and to Bertha, we love you. We love you and that we're a part of the body of Christ. We really are. And we want to celebrate this moment with you. And it was just really a real neat time. So how propos to this message today, I do, I do. Um, so I read this on Google and I thought it was just really interesting uh, what people have said about their promises in their marriage ceremonies. Uh, let me read you a few here. I don't want to get too many, but here's one that uh, someone read. I promise to protect you from carbon freezing and promise to protect you from the dark side, though hyperspace, through hyperspace, and into the far reaches of the galaxy. That was someone's, someone's uh, vows to, to the other side. <laughs> the, the second one read... Let us be friends and lovers and grow old disgracefully together. I don't know what that means, but what else? Here's one where the woman speaks for the man. The celebrant or the pastor or whoever was, was ministering says, Do you take this man to be your husband? And the bride says, I do. And then he says to the woman, or, or he says to the man, do you take this woman to be your wife? And the bride then says, he does. <laughs> uh, marriages are interesting, very interesting. I, I've been to somewhere where the minister forgets the names of those who are being married. Oh. Right, right in the middle of it. So I've never done that, thank God. I've always written those names down, so I didn't do that. Smart. But interesting stuff. I love weddings. This morning, we're going to look at the marriage feast. The Lord gives a parable pertaining to the religious leaders, and you'll get the context here right now as we ended in chapter 21. The two parables there that illustrated uh, Jesus acting with authority of the Father and of the Son. If you remember, the religious leaders asked him, where did you get your authority? Who gave it to you? And so Jesus is still refuting that with these three parables. And then chapter 22 opens with the third and final parable of these threes. And Matthew illustrates Jesus carrying the authority of the Spirit also in this parable because it is the Spirit of God that has anointed Jesus to perform His work. We have three points this morning. The first point is my witness. My witness. We all have a witness. We are being salt and light in this world. Our marriage to one another is to be a witness to the world. Paul made it very clear in Ephesians that it's a mystery, but our marriages reflect Christ and the church. And so it's so important that we have a good marriage. This morning's message is not on marriage, by the way, so you can relax. I'm not going to talk about marriage at all. <laughs> The second point is 
a judge mental judgment a judgmental judgment there's one judge one God and he has every right to judge us and then the third point chosen we have been chosen by God let's go ahead and read the text verses 1 through 14 so we get the context of what Jesus is sharing here so Jesus answered and spoke to them that is the religious leaders again by a parable and said the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come again he sent out other servants saying tell those who are invited see I have prepared my dinner my oxen and fatted calves are killed and all things are ready come to the wedding but they made light of it and went their way one to his own farm another to his business and the rest seized his servants threatened them spitefully and killed them but when the king heard about it he was furious and he sent out his armies destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities then he said to his servants the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in <coughs> to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gashing of teeth, for many are called but few are chosen. What a parable, huh? Yeah. yeah. Beautiful wedding feast. It begins wonderfully with invitations. And it ends with throwing someone into a pit of hell. Mm. Interesting. Let's break this up so we have an understanding of what Jesus is saying here. This parable about a wedding feast is a strange wedding, in fact. And it is. As we read it, the parable is similar to Luke chapter 14's parable, but different in its occasion and its details. But you can read it just to get some, some comparison there. This parable, again, demonstrates that Israel had repeatedly ignored God's message and would lose its favor and its position unto the Gentiles. Look at verse 1. Jesus answered and spoke to them again. Underline again, because it is pointing back to chapter 21. Again. So three parables, and again he answers by a parable. The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? In understanding this parable, Lisky said the eros is spoken in the Greek from the standpoint of the end of the world when the earthly history of the kingdom will be completely portrayed clearly. So what he's saying is, is that this parable that Jesus is giving, he's talking about a wedding feast that will take place in the future. And it hasn't taken place yet. But we will see it in the future. And he's talking back about the past, how his servants went out inviting many but many refused and then going to another group of people, good and bad, and inviting them, and the wedding feast was filled. When we get to that wedding feast, and we find it in Revelation chapter 19, it's going to be one of the greatest feasts that you have ever been to. The interpretation, the king is the father here, spiritually speaking, and Christ is the son. The son Christ is married to the bride, the church. We are the church. Jesus is the groom, and we are married to him. And that feast will take place in the future. So the father is arranging a marriage for his son, 
And nothing is more precious than a son uniting with a woman. It, it was just awesome yesterday to, to, to see Randy um, marrying Bertha. It, it was just so cool, so neat to see him so happy um, at that place. He's been single for quite a long time. And he's been waiting and praying for quite a long time. And it was just such a joy to see that ceremony. And, and it is. Marriages are, are beautiful. They should be because two people are, are very much in love, you know. And so it's a beautiful thing. And when a father arranges it, it's easier than more. I, I have married all my sons off to women. And that was such a blessing for me. Genesis 29-22 says that Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made such a great feast over his marriage ceremony. <clears throat> so it's something to be celebrated, the Bible says. Spiritually speaking, though, this marriage was arranged by the Father in heaven for his son Jesus Christ to Israel and then to the church. This is a wedding feast of grace, a marriage of grace, and a relationship of grace. Definitely grace, grace, grace. That it is favor. And we have to live our marriages by grace, don't we? You've heard the old joke. There's the uh, engagement ring, and then there's the wedding ring, and then there is the suffering in marriage, right? <laughs> and that suffering part, which we all laugh, but it's so true, and we always laugh at what is true. You know, it is the most difficult part of the marriage. It's so exciting when you have the engagement ring and everybody's in an uproar and everybody loves it and how wonderful and he's going to satisfy you and she's going to satisfy you and you're all hooplas and all that. And then the wedding and everyone's there and giving gifts and then all of a sudden you're married. And after 10 years, it's like, you know, this is hard. This is difficult. I don't know you anymore. What happened to that guy and that girl that I first fell in love with and so forth? And that's why it is a commitment. It is a vow that you are to commit. So that's as, as much as I'm going to talk about marriage. <clears throat> so let's go back to verse 3. It says that the king sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. Now it's interesting in the Greek here. And I love Greek because it, it just really amplifies what the scripture is saying here. The word call, who, who, those who were invited, the word invited uh, literally is called. So how it should be read is to call the called. That's how it should be read. He sent out servants to call the called to the wedding feast. Well, who are the servants? We can look at this, this spiritually speaking, and think about John the Baptist being a servant. Mm -hmm. and, and he had a call to call Israel into the kingdom of God. We can look at this as the 12 disciples who were also sent out. We can even look at it as, as Paul the Apostle, who was sent out to the Gentile, the church. And we can look at it as us being called to call the calls in the world. We have a responsibility to get out there and share the gospel with people. Now, who do they invite? Well, the lost sheep of Israel, Israel itself, and then the Gentile people. This is a double invitation. And it was customary to do that within the wedding feast. In fact, we do it sometimes with one another as we... Uh, set up our weddings. They would do it where they would, in advance, call everybody up and say there's going to be a great wedding feast on this day. And then right before the wedding feast, they actually call again and say it's happening on this day. You're invited to come. So a second call. We do it sometimes. We send out all the invitations. And then, of course, we go around and when we see those people, you are coming to the wedding, aren't you? <laughs> I hope you're coming to the wedding. Because it's going to be great. And we do that. And that's what they did here. We see it in Esther. Esther invited uh, Asherus and Haman to a feast. And then when the feast was ready, they sent servants out to call them to the feast again on that day. Now, who did he call first? Salvation always came to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And God isn't done with the Jew yet. He's working with the Gentiles today in Romans chapter 11. And you can read it. Uh, God's going to deal with the Gentile people one day. And that will probably happen during the tribulation period. So they were not willing to come, though. That is the Jewish people. Mm. And in the Orient custom, refusing an invitation from a king was a shocking insult, if you can only imagine. When you invite a person to your wedding, it's sad when they don't come. And it really is sad because it is one of the most intimate 
the celebrated events of your life. It, it's one of those events that you celebrate in life that, that is really meaningful. You know, there's the birth, you know, and then there's the graduation, and then there's the wedding that really takes place. And of course, the last celebration is the death, because everyone's done with you and they're ready and you're ready to go home. That was a joke, but you didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> These guys refused. They wouldn't come. I mean, they might send a gift, you know, some dishes, money, etc., whatever it is. But really, the person wants you there at the wedding celebration to celebrate with them in this venture of faith that you're about to enter into. And Christ wants you there, too at this great salvation, wedding feast that will take place in the end times. Don't let anything stop you from going there. <clears throat> because going there is so important. And so again, he sent out another servant saying, tell those who are invited, verse 4. See, I have prepared my, my dinner. And in this dinner, or lunch, because the Greeks suggest that it's not a dinner, it literally is a lunch has oxen, fatted calves, that were killed for a great feast. And all these things are ready. Come to the wedding. My witness, my first point. My witness. You know, the king sent out servants to invite a very loved group. This group were his favorite. They could have been relatives and friends, acquaintances, people that he did business with. His son is getting married. Who do you invite? Those that you love. Amen. Those that you want there. And so he sends the invitation out. But they refuse to come. God, the Father, sends us as witnesses to those that he loves. And who are those that he loves? All those that are lost. The Bible's clear, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. He loves the world and he's sending his servants out to the world to let them know that he loves them very much. He calls the servants to go out there. Why? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten of God, the Son. The world is condemned already. God didn't come to condemn them. They're condemned already. And we shouldn't condemn them either. I know sometimes we, we do that. We're trying to make a statement, you know, same-sex marriage, you're a homosexual, you know, we condemn you and, and that type of thing, but we really shouldn't. Everyone's condemned, whether they're homosexual or, or, or whether they're just adulterous or whether they're thieves or whether they are drunkards or whether they're just partying out in the world. Without Christ, they're all condemned. They're all condemned. I was condemned at one point until Christ came into my life and he saved me because I knew that he was the Son of God and I confessed him as my Lord and Savior. So condemning the world doesn't help. Loving the world does. Letting them know that they have a God that loves them and cares for them. <clears throat> Letting them know that there's nothing that they have done, nothing that they are doing that God cannot forgive. That can wipe clean without any problem at all. But it is the witness of that love. It is the sacrifice of that love that people see in the church that draws them to the Father in heaven. There's a story that I read on the internet, it's called The Important Work of Witness. The Important Work of Witness, written by Owens uh, Statue. I'm going to read it to you because I thought it was really good. <laughs> and I think it will minister to you. This is what he writes. I want to tell you a story about a girl from ancient times. She was a young woman possessing a quiet spirit. You might have found her type in any age, sweet, kind, and even modest. If she were around today, she might be a fixture at a youth group, a fan of Hillsong music, and a devotee to a local coffee shop. Her name is Blandia. She lived in the second century in present-day France. 
Hers was a humble life. In reality, it was a hard life. She was a slave girl. With many other in Leon, Lydia had become a Christian around AD 170. AD 170. Leon was the main city of Gaul, which was part of the Roman Empire, still the world superpower at the time, and officially a pagan in nature. Seeking unity, the emperor Domitian had made Christianity illegal during his reign from AD 81 to 96, and so it was still illegal at this time. This did, li this did little to stop the spread of the faith, however, and actually seemed to intensify it. Belinda was one tiny part of this unquenchable trend, anonymous and unnoticed, until that is the persecution of Gaul reached fever height. An anti-Christian spirit in Leon grew so great that household servants suspected of being Christian made up outrageous accusations against believers to save their own skin. That is, believers began to lie because they didn't want to die. Charges such as incest and murder were thrown around. Glenda and many other Christians were taken into official custody. The odds of their survival were not good. She was tortured under interrogation. Such official action was not fact-finding in nature. It was designed to break the will of the Christians in order to justify their impeding death. Glendina was not a strong girl. She was not hardy. Her torturers were trained soldiers of tough fiber. On the list of tasks for a Roman warrior, subdue young girls was easy. Ratchet up the pain, break some bones, and get the job done. That should have been what happened to Glendina. However, she did not die on the rack. Though she was tortured from morning till evening, until her body was mangled, no amount of pain led her to confess any error in being a Christian. She seemed to gain strength. In fact, when in the midst of her torture, she cried out, I am a Christian, and there is nothing vile done by us. This was a woman, a believer, of whom this world was not worthy, he writes. What a witness of Christ's power in a life that is surrendered to Jesus Christ. And yet we get so stressed when we have to share our faith with someone. Mm -hmm. What are characteristics of a mature witness for Christ? A mature evangelist. <clears throat> that is a characteristic. If you are a Christian and a believer in Christ, then you are e evangelist. And I'm not talking about the gift of evangelism and that you call yourself an evangelist. I'm just talking about being light to the world. You and I are the church and we are to be light to this world. We must remember that every believer is called to be light and salt. Is that not what the Bible says to us? Can I get an amen? amen. Have you read that in the scriptures? Yeah. That we are sight and salt and light to this world? And so we are to reflect the light of Christ in our very character and nature? We are to be salt in bringing healing but also in bringing some sort of, uh, of pain in the sense of stinging them to their sins and revealing that they need Christ even more. Yes. So we are all missionaries in whatever context God has put us in in this life, right? Yes. Whether we're students, teachers, businessmen, whatever profession it is, you're to be a light and salt in that area. You're to be sharing the gospel. We should be inviting people to church. If at least that is not sharing within the love of God. Wherever God has placed us, he placed us there to be witnesses. And we are a witness. You know that every one of us is a witness. We're a witness for something. Whatever that something may be. Maybe you're into sports. Well, you're a witness for sports. 
You might be a sports fanatic, a boxer, basketball, baseball, whatever it is. And you're a witness to that sport. And people that are sports-minded are drawn to you because you're a witness of sports. If you're a witness to drinking, then those that are also inclined to drink are going to be drawn to you too. You're a witness of something. Whatever that witness is, good or bad. So we might as well be a good witness for the kingdom of God. That people will see that something's different about you. Has that ever been said about you? About us? You're different. Something's different about you. What is it? Because I sense that. Well, it's Christ in me. That is what's different. Amen. And that should be evident because light should illuminate in dark Amen. places. It should. Jesus made it very clear in Matthew 28, 18 to 19. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am always with you to the ends of the ages. That's a command of God. We are to go out and share the gospel with people. And then make disciples of men. And right now you're being discipled. This is discipleship class, isn't it? I'm the pastor, and I'm equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And, and, and this equipment that is being equipping that is being presented to you should be taken by you and then used for the glory of God. Yes. Let's get back to verse 5. As they were stubborn, they wouldn't receive it. But they made light of it, verse 5 says. In other words, they began to laugh and mock and ridicule the king. They killed the messengers, including the Lord Jesus Christ himself, that is Israel. And they went their way. Underline their way, because we notice three things here about their way. And, and people have their way. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, but that way leads to death. Their way. Or you've heard the song, I did it my way. You know, and, and you might like your way. I often get people that, that come to me and tell me, I don't like the way you're doing it. And I'll just respond, well, how are you doing it? Well, I'm not doing it at all. Then I like my way. At least I'm doing something. Go do something and then let me know how it's going. But they went their way. They all turned their backs on the gospel and pursued their own worldly lusts and their own ways. See, Jesus came to the Jews and they didn't like his way. They liked their way, and they continued to go their way, and they rejected him. Notice one went where? To his own farm. And this is speaking about their own way. So I'm just going back to my own farm. And this is bringing contrast between the selfish interest and, and the respect that was due to the king. I don't care about the king. I care about my farm. And so I'm going back to the farm, and I'm going to farm animals because I don't have time for the king. There are a lot of Christians, at least in America, that think that way. I don't have time for God. I have to work on Sunday morning. And so I don't have time for Him because I have Sunday morning to work so that I can provide for my farm that is my household. Now, I'm not getting down on anyone that works on Sunday morning. I don't totally understand that. <clears throat> but I also understand there are a lot of people that understand that Sunday should be separated unto God. And they have taken whatever measures they can to get Sunday off. And they don't work Sunday mornings to come to church. Um, it takes a little labor, a little effort. There are laws that are put in place that we can use and say this is a day of worship for me, so I'd like to have that Sunday off. And I know some have done that too. But it is a day to seek the Lord first. Yeah. Does not the Bible say, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and everything else will be added unto you? Yeah. There's truth in that scripture. We must seek Christ first and his kingdom, and then he'll add everything else. I know that scripture to be true. I've experienced it. <laughs> when we put Christ first. But no, I've got my own farm. And look, another went to his business. Well, I've got a business. You don't understand my business. You're not a business person. You work for someone. Business is different than that. Now, what I understand is you put your business before God. And that's what they were doing. Mm. Jesus is giving shallow excuses to bring out the point that the impolite guests had no real reason for staying away from the banquet. 
They were just simply excuses because they did not care. Just as Jews had rejected the authority of the Father and the Son, they reject the ministry of the Holy Spirit too. See, the Holy Spirit illuminates truth and brings truth. And we talked about this last week, how we can quench the Holy Spirit. God is ministering to you right now, and you have a choice. You either receive it and say, Lord, you're right. I need to change some things. Or you can quench the Spirit and say, I don't care. I'm not listening to this, and start looking at your phone. Mm. Start doing something else. Thus, you quench the Spirit a little bit. Be careful, because as you heard last week, you can quench it to a point where God's just going to leave you alone. So they rejected. They were too busy to Jesus. And the rest seized his servants, treated them. Spitefully, verse 6 says, and they killed them. And we see that truly happened with Jesus. And when the king heard about it, and king, the king of kings hears everything, sees everything, knows everything, there's nothing that gets by our king. He sees it all. It says he was furious. You know, God is slow to anger. Yeah. He bears much. He suffers long. But now he's furious because there is a point where he knows that line's been drawn and you've gone over it and there's no more hope for you. And so he stirred up with wrath and anger. So he sends out his armies to destroy those murderers and burn up their city. Some have thought this was literally fulfilled in AD 70 when Titus of Rome went down to Jerusalem and just sacked the whole place and took everything inside, burned it down and took all the gold even within the cracks, turned over the temple rocks to make sure all the gold was taken out and dispersed the Jewish people throughout the world. And maybe it was, or this could be speaking of the tribulation period, mm. that God will send his armies and will judge Israel. <clears throat> My second point, a judgmental judgment. Does Jesus have the right to judge us? Have you ever asked that question? Does he have the right to judge us? We all go, well, yeah, but why? Have you ever asked yourself, why? Who gave him that right? I mean, are, aren't they entitled to their own opinion? To live their own lives the way they want and not be bothered by someone? Aren't they entitled to that stuff? Mm. In America, I guess you are. You can do whatever you want. You're entitled to it. But how about with God? Listen to what James says. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is, only, there is one lawgiver, and, and the text adds judge, who is able to save and destroy. Who is that? That's God. There's one lawgiver. Now he's talking in the context here about us judging each other and putting ourselves in a, in a place of judgment and condemning people. We have no right to do that. There's only one lawgiver, and that's God. He's the only one that's able to judge us and to destroy us. So who are we to condemn one another, as James saying here? See, a judge is a person with authority, which was appointed to him by law or with laws. And he has to uphold that law, right? Because he's been appointed to it. And if someone breaks the law, then as a judge, he makes a judgment that that person has broken the law. The evidence shows it, so he's guilty, and he can be sent to prison. We find in the Old Testament scriptures that kings were always the supreme judge because this was the supreme ruling authority. So a king's word was it. And of course, we saw in the earthly realm, it got out of hand, but they were given that right as a king. According to the Bible, God is the judge of this world. He's our maker. He owns us. And as our owner, he has every right to judge us. He created us. And so he has every right to correct us and judge us if need be. He has, therefore, that right because he made the laws and enforced the laws and even will reward us for keeping the laws. Do not parents do this every day? As parents, we do it all the time. We are the ones that make the judgments on our children. We are the ones that make the rules. We're the ones that enforce the rules. We're the ones that bring down the judgment with the belt to the seat of understanding. Right? We do it all the time. So why can't God be the judge? 
of us. He has that authority. Revelation 20, 11 through 15 says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Who was it? Romans 14, 12 says, Then each of us will give an account of himself to God. And then Jesus comes along, and he says this in Matthew 28, All power and authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. See, we understand that he is the king of kings and the lord of lords, and that he will return one day as judge of this earth. Yes. Matthew 19, 11 says, I saw heaven open up, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. That is Jesus Christ. Jesus testified that the Father has committed all judgment unto him, John 5, 22. Therefore, it's correct to say that the Son of God has the right to judge us. Jesus said, I came of my own self, or I can of my own self do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father, which has sent me. In Psalms 9, 8 says, he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. So we have a perfect judge who sits in heaven to judge us. And so if you want anyone judging you, you want God to judge you. But we can get out of that judgment by simply having Jesus into our hearts. Amen. Let's see how. Look at verse 8. <coughs> so he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those who are invited, <laughs> they're not worthy. They're not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So he determined, you know, that those weren't ready, nor were they worthy. And so let's go beyond them and let's go find others that are willing to come out. So the servants uh, went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. So apparently they went out and they just grabbed the people. Come on in. We have a wedding. There's a lot of food. There's a lot of celebration. The king doesn't know you. We don't care. Just come on. Let's go have some food. Good or bad. Just come in together. Kind of like a net. Throw the, throw the net out in the water and all the fish and whatever else comes with it. And then you separate the good from the bad. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Throw that net out to the Gentile world. Gather them in. But when the king came to see the guests, and this is the separating part of it, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. <laughs> it's interesting because we had no wedding garments yesterday, but the bride who had on the wedding dress yesterday was Randy's wedding. And there were people with shorts on, there were people with Hawaiian shirts, you know. It was, it was really cool. This is not talking about their dress. This is talking spiritually. When they gathered people, they gathered people that, uh, with hearts that were not ready to receive Christ. And so the king's looking out there, and that word is, as he's looking out there, that word see means looking carefully, intensely, searching the hearts of people. Mm. See, God can stand here, and he is here, and he's searching your hearts. He's looking at your hearts. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows what you're doing. He knows what you're contemplating. You know, and he's trying to minister to your heart because he sees very clearly every one of your hearts. That could be scary, but that can also be beautiful. Yes. Because he knows your heart, especially when others don't know your heart. But at the same time, we need to be open with our hearts and transparent to him and be willing to change. But he saw this man there who did not have on a wedding garment. And so there was a wedding garment that was required. It's necessary that we are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ in order to attend the wedding feast of the Lamb in Revelation 19. And that righteousness is given to us by Jesus Christ. So we see this guy. He's not clothed. He's not ready. And so the king said to the 
said to the friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless, or the word suggests that he was muzzled. He couldn't say a thing. He has, because he had no evidence, he had nothing to, to um, defend himself with, because there was a requirement. I think when the gospel goes out sometimes, <clears throat> and people begin to come to church, and they come to church for various reasons. And I've seen it. I've seen in this church. It's amazing. Uh, I've seen men come here because they're looking for a bride. They're not coming here because of Jesus. And then God revealed, God sees their heart that they're not here for him. They're here because they want to get married to someone. And he sees their hearts. And eventually they go. I've seen people come in because they're ill. They're very sick. You know, and it's sad. And it hurts. But they're healed. They're here to find a healing and not God. They want God to heal them so they can go on living their own life and taking care of their business and taking care of their farms. And God sees their heart. Those are the people that God is talking about here. And I might be talking to some that have been in this church right now as they look at me on Facebook. That you've used God. You thought God was a genie in a bottle. That you can kind of rub and he'll answer all your prayers and wishes and then you'll be okay when he is not. And he sees your heart and your intent. You should be here because you are a part of the wedding feast. You have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You're here for the right reasons. To worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. To give him your heart and to love him with all the gifts that he has given unto you. For his glory, not for your own. For any other reason, is fleshly and carnal, and God will not receive it. Don't deceive yourself, because God sees our hearts. But be willing to be transparent to Him, so He can bring healing to you and a relationship. And what is sad is that God does, and I've seen it heal some of these people, and then they go home and do what they did in the past. And not only have they lost their salvation, if they even had it. But even their whole household is unsaved. What a great opportunity to come to church. Okay, so I came because I, I need healing. And then you find healing and you fall in love with the healer. Amen. And not only do you get saved, but then your husband and wife get saved. And then your children get saved. And then your family gets saved. And they're all eternally saved. But no, because we're so selfish, all we want is a healing so we can live our own lives. Why do you come to the wedding feast without the garments? And the guy had no excuse. No excuse. Then the king said to the servants, buy him, hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Mm. Salvation is difficult to obtain, and through many, though many are called, to it, few are willing to give up their temporal flesh life for the sake of eternal soul life. Mm. That's what he's saying. I call so many to the wedding feast, gather them all, good and bad, but only few are chosen. Many of them will not last. Many of you may not last. I hope you do. I hope that your heart is on the Lord and focused there. Yes. He will test that, by the way. He will bring trials to you to see if your heart is truly connected to him. And he will show you whether it is or whether it's not. Because you will endure and persevere through things. But if you do not and fall back into the world and drinking and partying and doing all those things, then you are not part of the wedding gathering. You weren't chosen. Salvation is difficult because it is a surrendering of yourself every single day yes. of your life. Don't be fooled that Christianity is something easy to do. It's easy to get saved, confess the Lord with your heart, and he'll save you. But now live that out is very difficult. Amen. Those who hear and respond favorably to God's invitation are able to join him in this great celebration. That's the positive part of this message. So my last point, chosen. How does God choose? Has he chosen me? Many people are called by God, but only a few will respond, as I said, if they truly are hearing. Jesus said many times, he who has an ear, let him hear 
let him hear. We have ears, which we do, two, that's why he gave us two in one mouth. We mm -hmm. hear more than speaking more. We need to hear what he is saying. Everyone has ears. But only a few are listening and responding to the message. To the message of the gospel of what the word of God says. There is no in interest or there is no outright love for God. They just won't hear it. Many are called or invited into the kingdom, but none of them are able to come on their own. See, God has to draw them with the heart. The masses were invited into this wedding feast, but a few persons found God's grace and love. Now, how do we know if we are among the few that have ears to hear? By responding to the call. That's how we know. It's really simple. <clears throat> If you're questioning whether you're called or chosen, then that's good because you care. Yes. If you don't care and you're just sitting here and you're enduring this and just kind of listening, la 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 la, like my, you know, kids oftentimes do as you're speaking to them and they're like, la 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 la, <laughs> they're not listening to you. Then you're not listening. You don't care, so you're not chosen. You're not called. But the fact that you care and the fact that you want to do the right things and live the right way. Tells me that you're chosen because you're responding to that call. I want to do something. I want to be a part of the kingdom. Amen. I want to fulfill his purpose for my life. If we listen with our spiritual ears and respond to that invitation, there will be fear and trembling in our souls as we recognize that it was God's work in us that caused our salvation. He moves us through the spirit of God. Let me close with this. Whether or not you accept the wedding garment, that's up to you. We do have free choice. But Christ has provided it for you. Here's the choosing part. It's like going to a barbecue. And we begin to prepare the meat. We prepare the grill. We throw the filet mignon under the grill. And we cook it to the right place that you like it. And then we take it, put it on a plate, put a little garland, put a little dressing on there, and we bring it to you, and we put it on the table. We're not done yet. We start cutting it up for you into nice little bite sizes. And when it's all cut up, we take a fork, and we take a piece of the meat, and we put it right to your mouth. Now, your part comes in. You have to grab it and chew it. God's done everything else. All you have to do is grab that meat and chew it and swallow it. That's how you know you're chosen. God has done everything else that yes, he needs yes. to do and bring your will to say, yes, I want it. So he has chosen you all the way to that point. Many are called, but few are chosen. So the invitation has gone out to everyone, but you'll have to come to the king on his terms. And that is through Jesus Christ. Amen. If you've not come to a personal relationship with Jesus, then you have no relationship with God at all. It is only through Jesus Christ that one can gain access to the Father. The Bible tells us we all have sinned and deserve God's Amen. judgment. But God the Father sent his only Son to satisfy that judgment for those who believe in in him. And Romans says in 10 9, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Thank it's that Jesus. simple. And it's a simple prayer. If I can ask the group to come on up. I would like to lead you in that prayer. Especially to those who might be listening on Facebook right now. If you just bow your heads and simply say this, Lord, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he came and he died and paid the penalty for the sins that I have committed. I ask you to forgive me and to give me the gift of eternal life that you promised. Come into my life and give me a new beginning. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. I surrender my life to you now. And I repent from my old life 
and I begin to walk towards you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's stand, and we'll, we'll close with this song. Thank you for joining us. I hope that you will consider the things that the Spirit of God has said. And if you have ears to hear, then hear what He is saying to you this morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your word. May you just take that word and may it grow into something beautiful in our lives. That more light, that more salt would shine to this world, Lord. That we would become courageous and bold in sharing our faith and inviting people to church, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.